Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Lord's house. Welcome to His church. Welcome to His word. We were blessed, much blessed today with the music, the worship. We pray for those amongst us who are sick and recovering. Pray for those who are traveling, like Brother Tony and his family. He sent me a text this morning telling me that he is in uh, Louisiana visiting with his daughter and they went to a church. He sent me the picture of the church and I said hallelujah. So he did find a church. He was looking for one, he found one and he'll probably be coming back tomorrow. Pray for others who are missing in our midst, perhaps on their way, perhaps held by whatever. Pray that this morning will be a blessed one for them as well as for us. I'd like to invite you if you don't mind to open your Bibles or read with me a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. Epistola de San Pablo a los Corintos capítulo 4 versículo 3. We have a visitor from Mexico. I'm going to try to insinuate some words in Espanol. But also, let's read it together. If our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those being lost. Let's say it one more time. But also, if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost. Father, we commit this to you, Lord. Please guide in Jesus' name. Amen. If our gospel. Interesting enough, our verse tells us what is the main mission of a minister, of a Christian, of every Christian. It is to preach what? The gospel. That's right. The gospel. Not politics, not logic, not science. Because sometimes we feel like we should become men of science to the world. Not economy, but the gospel. That's right, the gospel. The gospel, which is translated as the good news. Good. There's something good in the gospel. It is the story that there is hope for the guilty that there is someone who came from heaven as we broke the bread who came to rescue every guilty person Jesus Christ is good this is good news for those who are perishing for those who are lost for those who are hopeless there is hope and it's also news good it is and new it is the gospel is something new Mythology never dreamt of the gospel. The Greeks in their philosophy and culture never really could have fathomed the gospel. Mankind could have never invented it. The angels could have never said it. It's something new. That God will come from heaven and rescue by paying himself the dues and the debts that we owe something very new comes new to every ear and notice that Paul says if our gospel he doesn't call it the gospel he said my gospel our gospel and this tells us that whoever is to preach the gospel should have himself have benefited from that gospel he should have appropriated that gospel I have no right to preach the gospel unless I myself have benefited from the gospel it'll be ridiculous to ask people to go and preach the gospel when they themselves have not experienced its effect have not experienced those good and new things that can happen to you that God can save can change and I'm changed I cannot tell people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved unless I am saved and I cannot tell people to go and drink of the water of life freely unless I have drank of that water of life myself. And Paul 
who was saved and his life proved that he was saved and he persevered in that salvation despite everything that he went through that Paul says this is our gospel I am saved and therefore I am preaching that gospel and he brought those words and he said if our gospel this glorious gospel this gospel that can save any human being and that every human being needs if that gospel if our gospel that can save the meanest the lowest the one the filthiest it takes the most poor and the most despondent and the most hopeless and it lifts them up and puts them on the same pedestal as the son of God to become priests and kings in the courts of the king of kings and the lord of lords it is this gospel our gospel that is the greatest and only mission of every true Christian in this world. And I want to tell you, anytime there is any pulpit anywhere that doesn't preach the gospel, this is no pulpit of Christ. This is our mission, folks. This is the mission of every church. This is the mission of every pulpit that the gospel of Christ should be proclaimed to every sinner all the time. And every single time the gospel but unfortunately you would think that this should be made clear to human humanity if such a message is given then everybody should understand it but look what he says if our gospel is what hidden could you believe it that our gospel this very plain gospel is hidden it is not clear no matter how well it is preached no matter how plainly it is said simple words Jesus came from heaven died for you you're going to hell and you need to receive Jesus no matter how plain we make it and we try sometimes to push it into someone's ear say do you understand <laughs> did you get it it's like they don't the great majority doesn't and I think this is today what I'd like to tell you why why is the gospel hidden from the majority how come Lord Jesus said it will be hidden he said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 he said for for narrow or is the gate and very constricted is the way which leads to life and there are how many few. few will find it Lord Jesus said when you go to preach the gospel unfortunately you're gonna come across something that may shock you at first but I want to prepare you for it that the majority will not get it and like today to tell you why they don't get it why is the gospel hidden why don't they figure it out it's so simple so plain I mean it cannot be more simple than that we repeat it we say it but yet it is hidden why is the gospel hidden to so many and uh, the second thing I would like to make the second point I'd like to make today is what is the state the present state of those from whom it is hidden and what is their future that's it two points i'll make before you today first why is the gospel hidden to so many and secondly what is the present state and the future of those from whom it is hidden why is the gospel hidden why it says if our gospel is hidden it is hidden to them that are lost there are many who have not seen Jesus yet they know about Jesus but they have not encountered Jesus they haven't seen him in the eyes of faith and to them this gospel is hidden notice that the apostle does not blame himself for that he doesn't say it's my fault oh no he says if 
if this gospel is hidden, it is hidden to because of them. They are lost. He says, I've done my share. And boy, did he do his share. Did he do his share to go and preach the gospel to every creature, every mankind? He took boats. He took, he, he walked. He persevered. He went to every possible area where he could because he wanted to do his share so that the blame would not fall on him. He said, I've done all I can. I went to as many places and I said it with the most plainest words. I made my words not eloquent, not elegant, but simple to understand that that little child could understand it. He would give them things like, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. I mean, any child could understand that. He would say things to them, trust in him who came from heaven and he will take your sins away. No plain, no eloquent, no, no eloquent, no, no difficult things to understand, but plain words. He said, I did my share. I cannot be blamed. And I hope all of us here sitting in this room, all of us Christians can say, I'll never be blamed because I've used every single opportunity I had, every encounter I came across to preach the gospel. I hope this will be our faith that will not be blamed in the long run saying, the Lord say, well, I'll put those people in front of you. I gave you such opportunity, you didn't take it. But we can see and sense like Paul that we are here to preach the gospel and we've done it. And we've done it as many times as we could. Every single opportunity we could. In the plainest words we can. We brought it to as many people. Every single day of our lives. After we got saved. I've been preaching the gospel. So it's not my fault. We can say with Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16. For if I preach the gospel. I have nothing to boast in. For necessity is laid on me. Yea, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. I preach the gospel. It's because I have to preach the gospel. It is my need is to preach the gospel. I don't run away from it. I do it because I have to. And if I don't, woe is me. May the Lord give us to be of those kinds of people that we can bring the message to as many people so that we ourselves do not be blamed before God that we did not take advantage of the opportunities he's given us. And we can say it in plain words like Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that the Christ Jesus came from into the world to save sinners. That's it. That's the gospel. This is it. Let us say it. Let us say it to as many people as we can. Let us say it all the time. Let us say it every single time. Let's make it very simple. And then we can say, I've done my share. See, it's not my responsibility. Like Paul said, he said, I can't be blamed. I did it. But then, even after you do it, after Paul did it, somehow it still be hidden from so many. Don't be blamed for it. Don't blame yourself. But expect it to be hidden from so many. And you wonder, why? Why is the gospel hidden from so many? The answer comes in the next verse. Right after 2 Corinthians 4, 3. It says, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. It says, in whom? Would you read that with me? The God... Small, small G, by the way. He's not a real God, but he, people consider him as the God. Talking about Satan. The God of this world. Those who treat him like he's the God. He's not really a God, but the God of this world has what? Blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn on them. They cannot see it. He's put like a little blinder in front of them. And you wonder, how does Satan do this? I mean, what exactly are we talking about? How, what does he put? What is the blinders that Satan uses to blind people so they don't see the gospel? Because if they see the gospel, they get saved. He doesn't want them to see it. So he makes sure he puts blinders. What are the blinders 
that Satan uses to blind people from seeing this glorious, necessary, this indispensable gospel that is so precious, so much needed. While we are doing our share, and I hope we do, and we're doing it, why so many are still blinded? How does Satan do it? To begin with, Satan does it by minimizing the horror of sin. People say to me, I remember at least once or twice I heard this, even here on the pier in Seal Beach. I hear it from my dear friends from the old country who are Muslims. Why? Why do you guys have to make such a big deal about sin? Why does God have to send his only son to die for our sins? Come on. God is good. We're all humans. He'll forgive us. It's no big deal. I say to anyone who says sin is not a big deal, I say, look what God had to do because of sin. Let me tell you what God has done. He rocked the peace of heaven. The routine life of heaven was changed, disturbed. And he sent his only begotten son, took him from heaven, brought him down to the earth, and laid upon him every single penalty of sin. That's how horrible sin is to God. Yes. And unless you see the horror, horror of sin, you will not see the gospel. That's right. If you think sin is no big deal, it's okay. I'm just, you know, I'm human. You know, I slip. Everybody sins. Yesterday we were talking to people on the pier and almost everyone will answer, everybody sins. We say, have you ever sinned? Oh, yeah, you know, usual, customary, like everybody. It's no big deal. Everybody sins. I said, no, no, you Oh, me? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. Okay. It's you who's going to give account. Sin is ugly. Sin is horrible. Sin is despicable. When you don't see how horrible it is, you will not see the gospel. You will not appreciate the gospel. So Satan tries at first to tell people, it's no big deal. You're okay. It's not a big deal. You sin a little bit. Come on. After all, you're a human. It's okay. But sin is horrible. And unless you see how horrible it is, you will not appreciate the gospel nor see the gospel. In fact, not only you don't realize how sin is horrible, you actually like it. That's right. I tell people who don't want to receive the gospel, I say it's because you don't want to let go of your sin. You love your sin. People who don't want to get saved are people who really love their sin. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 19, light came into the world. A lux came into el cosmos. But men, hombres, loved darkness rather than light. Because they're what? Their deeds are what? Evil. You see, people don't want to come to the light because they don't want to let go of the bad things they're doing. They hold on to those sins and they say, you know, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to keep enjoying it for a while. Yesterday there was a young man who almost accepted the Lord. He said, yeah, I'm a sinner. Yep. I, I think I'm going, uh, I had him say it. He said, to hell. He said, yeah, I'm going to hell. I asked him, how long does hell last? He said, forever. I said, you don't want to go there? He said, no. I figured, you know, he's ready. Let's say he's ripe. I said, would you like to confess your sin and receive Jesus now? He said, not now. I said, why? He said, not yet. And I told him flat out, why not yet? I said, because you don't want to let go of that sin of yours, do you? He didn't answer. He just kept walking. You don't want to let go of it, do you? You love your sin. This is why you don't want to see the gospel. This is why you're blinded because you don't want to let go of it. You love sin and when you love sin, you will not be able to see the gospel. It is hidden from you because you don't understand how poisonous, how horrible, how dangerous sin is. You fool, I tell someone who's still delaying. You fool! Don't you understand that the venom, that the serpent that bit you is going through your veins? That venom that fascinates you of sin, that venom that blinds you is the same venom that will burn in you forever and ever unless you realize that you are in bad shape, that you are in danger. 
you will not run to Christ. And I hope you do realize the danger of sin. That you will look at the serpent, the brazen serpent that was lifted like Moses lifted the brazen serpent in the wilderness. That whosoever looks at it will not perish but will be recovered. You need to realize that the little tiny sin that's in you is the poison that will take you to hell. That sin is horrible. And Satan does a great job by telling people sin is no big deal. And therefore he blinds them from seeing the gospel. And Satan also blinds people. Another blinder he uses. Not only does he confuse them about the horror of sin, but he confuses them about themselves. There are people, and I hope there aren't too many here like this, who still feel that they're okay. In other words, I can save myself. Like someone told me once, he said, you know, look, I give money in the church. I attend church once in a while when I can. And I'm not so bad. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't gone to jail. So come on. God is going to let me go. He's going to let me into his heaven. Right? I'm, I'm not bad. I'm your average person. I'm, I even wear a cross here. And I, I come on. I'm, I tell people I'm Christian. I'm not all that bad. And I'm working my way to heaven. I said, how far are you? He said, I'm almost there. But I still have some work to do. I hope I'll com uh, complete it. And one day I'll arrive there. To that heaven not realizing that everything let me tell you everything we do before we're saved is sin did i say it clearly every action every word every thought we do before we're saved is sin because it's coming from us who are already stained with sin so everything comes out from us already stained because we're stained ourselves so don't try to impress God with your activities because it's already dirty. It's coming from a dirty source. Dirty source will give what? Dirty water. Nothing comes out clean from somewhere that is unclean. Everything comes out unclean. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6. It says, but we all are, listen to this, but we all are what? As the unclean thing. That's right. We're all unclean. You see, we've been stained from the inside. We've been born unclean. And all our righteous and unri righteousness are as what? Wow. I like that translation. That's the first time. This is what, another King James. As filthy rags, it says, says here worse, as menstruation cloth. Oh my God, this is horrible. <laughs> filthy rags is another one I'm used to. Menstruation cloth. Where did you find that one, brother? <laughs> and we all fade as a leaf and our inequities like the wind have taken us away. Listen. Don't try to impress God with your goodness, with your good works and think you're going to earn your way to heaven. It's all filthy. It's ugly because the source, your heart, has already been made unclean when you were born in sin. Did my mother conceive me? Therefore, every single action you do, every single word you say, every single thing you think you're impressing God is already bad. It's a sin. Did I make myself clear about this? Don't try to buy your way to heaven. You can't. Unless you realize that you are unclean from the beginning to the end, from the top to the bottom, and you run to be rescued by Jesus Christ, and you look at him as your savior, you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Please, I cannot enter your heaven because I'm unclean. Change me. And don't allow me to even try to do anything to earn my way to heaven. Save me by your blood. Cover me, Lord Jesus. Unless you realize in the words of Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, when the Lord said to the angel of the church, who said, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And you don't know unless you know that you are what? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I have nothing. To offer God except my filth. So I come with my filth and say, Lord, cover me. I'm naked. I'm wretched. I'm miserable. I'm poor. I got nothing, nothing, nothing. Except my filthy nature. And then, only then, will the simple gospel be revealed to you. Only then you will understand. Oh, that's right. There is a savior that can help me. Only then, unless you understand the horror of sin, and unless you understand the horror of your state, you will not be saved. 
you will not see the gospel. You're blinded. You're still thinking sin is no big deal, and I'm okay. And those who think that sin is no big deal and they're okay are blinded by Satan and they're taken along where Satan is heading to his hell. That's right. And then also people are blinded by Satan as Satan keeps puffing up their pride and keep them very occupied with worldly events, worldly business, worldly ventures. So it keeps them puffed up with pride. How did uh, Satan tempt the Lord Jesus? Do you remember? Does anybody remember how he tempted the Lord Jesus? The three temptations? Bread? Yes. Secondly? On the wall. Bow down before me. Thirdly, throw yourself from the temple. God will take care of you. You see, three ways Satan tempted Jesus. First, he tempted him with the lust of the flesh. Go ahead, eat. You're hungry. Come on. Doesn't, don't have to wait for God. Come on, make those stones to become bread. And then he, he, he did this act on him, the lust of the eyes. Come on, look at all these nations. I can give them to you. Just bow down and worship me. And thirdly, he said, throw yourself from the temple. And you know what? God owes it to you. He'll take care of you and you become special. You see, you become famous. Pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And this is exactly how Satan continues to blind people. He puffs up their pride. He tells them, you are big. Stay higher than everybody else. He tells them that they are, they are more important than anybody else. And then he also keeps them busy, busy, busy with shady and shameful worldly pursuits. That's right. Pride of life. And lust of eyes, lust of the flesh. But the Bible says, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, the Lord Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to, unto you, unless you are what? Converted and become as what? Little as little children. You need to humble yourself. Unless you become like a little baby. Come on, just don't try to impress me. You're, you're big. You're nothing. Come like a little child. You shall not enter in the kingdom of heaven. I tell people who are still think that they're better than others, I say, come down because only the humble will see the blessing. Only the humble will see the gospel. God will only reveal his gospel to the humble. Those who are proud, proud will never see it. They look at it, they don't see it. They think they're bigger than better than anybody. I'm not bad, I'm better, in fact. In fact, I'm really good. And Satan keeps pumping them. You're good. You're really good. Come on, here, here's another blinder for you. You're really good. And then he blinds them by keeping them so busy with worldly shady pursuits. Shady pursuits. I said the great majority of people who don't see the gospel are people who are businesses are shady. Their gold is shady. Their businesses cannot stand being scrutinized. They're doing things on the side. I remember in my hometown, that's right, in my hometown in Lebanon, this one guy, the brethren in that church, I was there once, one summer, and they were, they said, we should go to this guy, would you come with us and preach the gospel to him? We preached the gospel to him so many times, his wife accepted the Lord, but he is not coming. He comes to church, but he still says, I haven't been saved yet. So we came and sat with him. You know what he told us? Plain, simple. He said, listen, I have two daughters that are going to college. I have big bills to pay. I said, well, what does that have to do with the, with the gospel? With you being saved? He said, plain, simple. I have to cheat in my business to pay the bills. But I promise you that once those two girls graduate from college, I will accept the Lord. Just gonna wait till they finish schooling, you know. I have to pay the bills. <coughs> Do you understand? I mean, Satan keeps people busy with shady business so they are blinded from seeing the urgency and the necessity of the gospel that is needed for them, and they toy with eternity thinking that one day they'll stop their shady business, but they never do, by the way. They never do. He takes them from bad to worse. They never, 
do because Satan is a master at blinding people. First he blinds them with making them see that sin is not that too bad and not horrible. And he blinds them by making them realize that they're not so bad themselves. After all, they're doing some good things. They give money once in a while to the church. They attend church occasionally. So they're really not bad. Come on. And then he blinds them by puffing their pride. And he blinds them by keeping them occupied with worldly, worldly, shady pursuits. Satan is a master. And that master is very successful and many of the people even that we preach the gospel to them and I hope there is no one here in this place who is still blinded by Satan. I plead to you because I have given the message. It is your responsibility to examine yourself and to see are you blinded by Satan? And if you are, realize that you are in big danger. Run and be rescued. I don't care how precious your sin is to you. I don't care how precious your shady business is to you. I don't care how much money it's making you. I don't care how rich it's making you. Even if it's your right eye, pluck it out and get rid of it. As the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, he said, if your right eye, Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, then take it out, pluck it out, and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast in hell. No matter what the loss is, it doesn't matter what it is. Lose it now better than losing your eternity and being in hell for eternity. So this is how Satan blinds people, folks. He's very much masterful. We need to pray for people around us. And we need to come and, and bring that gospel over and over because sometimes they don't hear it the first time, the third time, second time. Yesterday, Brother, brother uh, Ed noticed one thing. We were having like a dry spell yesterday. First 45 minutes on the pier in Seal Beach, one hour, nobody accepting the Lord. Everybody refusing. So in fact, people ridiculing us. People, no, I don't need it. I'm fine. Just leave me alone. I mean, there were, were hostility. We said, this is dry. We said, we cannot do anything against. There's actually a spirit of blindness here. I remember taking Brother Ed, Sister Hanan, Joy, etc. We prayed, Lord, Lord, there's, there's something. There's an evil spirit here. We cannot penetrate. Lord, please have mercy. Lord, please have mercy. Lord, open the eyes of someone. Lord, Expel that evil spirit that's blinding people here. They're not seeing the importance of the gospel. They're looking at it as nothing. And shortly after, there were two young ladies. Ed is shaking his head. And at first they were resistant, but then suddenly, suddenly, something happened, sparked in them. They realized the horrible horror of sin and the danger of sin. And they said both, we don't want to go to hell. I said, nor does God want you to go to hell. What, what can we do so that we don't go to hell? I said, well, Jesus is in the middle right here, and he's standing right here in the midst, and he wants to save you from hell. And one of them said, I want to be saved. And the other one said the same thing. And they both prayed, and they received Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, it is a spiritual blindness that Satan puts, so we can only win it by praying for these people and persisting in preaching the gospel. The gospel will penetrate with prayer. It will penetrate with God's spirit. It will penetrate. And I pray today that if there is anyone here who is still unsaved, that the Holy Spirit will begin showing you the horror of sin and the horror of your state and the horror of pride and the horror of being worldly and being lover of the world. That you see your need and run and get rescued by Jesus who is in our midst. Secondly, second point I'd like to make and I close with that. What is the present state of those who are lost and what is their future? Look, it says, but also if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden from those being what? Lost. lost. I don't know if there is any worse world, word in the English language than the lost. In fact, I don't know if there is any, any worse than that. That's probably the, the worst word in the English language. Another translation, perishing. Another translation, lost. You're lost. If you are not saved today, you are lost. 
Let me tell you what loss means. I don't know if some of you have experienced this coming back home, your wife told you your little child is lost. I don't know if that happened to anybody. Did it happen to anybody? One time, here we go, one. Happened second time. I don't think you were very happy when that happened, were you? It happened to us, we were at the mall. Paula remembers that. And our wonderful Sam got lost. Let me tell you, there were tears, there was panic. There was call to the guard, security and police, and where is our son? And I'm sure you did the same thing. Where is our child? Because you knew that there's danger for that child to be lost. That child may stay alone. He may have to face nature alone. Dangers alone. He is in danger. And that's what's your state if you're lost. You are in huge danger when you're lost. You're lost to the church. You say, but I'm attending church. You think you are part of the church, but you're not. You see, coming in the body to the church doesn't make you part of the church. You can come as many times as you want to the church and attend and shake hands with people, but you're really not part of the church. And one day you will not be part of the eternal, glorious church of the redeemed around the Lord Jesus because only those who have received the gospel will go to heaven. You can come to this church, but you're not part of the real church. You're lost and you're in danger. And you're a big danger. You're lost to God. You're lost to him who has shown you so much love. You have strayed away from him. You have refused his hand that was extended to you over and over. Yesterday we were telling people how much God loves them. And I always bring out this, uh, this verse of scripture from Matthew chapter 10 verse 30. It says, but don't you know that the very hairs of your head are all what? Numbered. Numbered. I think the great majority were shocked. I would tell them something like this. Do you know that this is hair number 133,560? I said, no, I didn't know that. And this is hair number 133,561. God knows the hair on your head. He has given them a number. Every single one. That's how much he cares for you. But you've strayed from him. You've ignored him. You just thought that you can take care of yourself by yourself. And you can come occasionally to church and you'll be fine. You need to realize that you're lost. That you're lost and that you need to come back. You need to be found. Nobody can be found unless first they realize that they're what? That they're lost. Nobody will tend to want to go back home unless they realize they're far from home. You need to realize that you're far, you're lost, and you need to come back to God, to Christ, and look at Him who saves you, who saves sinners, and you come and be rescued and receive something that is new to you. You need to recognize your state. People don't go to a doctor unless they, they think they're what? They're sick. You're not going to be found unless you realize that you are what? You're lost. So I'm going to ask something from every single one of you here in this assembly. I'm going to ask you something to do for your own sake. Ahora, un más importante something. Help me with Espanol. I want you today, today, when you go home, you take a piece of paper, you write your name on it, and you choose one of two words that fit your state. Either lost or saved. That's right. Put your name and put next to it, honestly, searching your heart honestly by yourself before you go to sleep tonight. And I hope you do it even now while you're sitting in your mind. That you put next to your name the word lost or saved, whichever fits you. And if you put the word lost, and I want you, by the way, to sign your name at the end. Just sign it. Put your name. Put lost or saved and then sign it. Would you do it this evening? Yes. I want to tell you, it'll bring peace to your mind. God will honor this. Put your own name with your own handwriting and sign it. And either put the word lost or saved and sign it. And I hope and pray, if anyone will see that word lost, signed with your own name, you realize that this is the verdict that you're going to be getting at the seat of God. 
at the great throne, it's going to be with your own handwriting. See, you wrote that you lost. And I hope that will bring you to be awakened and will break your heart because the reason you're not saved is because your heart has not been broken. You need to be broken. You need to realize the horror of your state that you lost. And immediately, I guarantee you, immediately, the moment you realize that you lost, the same moment, the blinders will disappear and you will see the gospel of Jesus Christ and you will see Christ opening his arms to you and you will run to him and get saved. The moment you realize you're lost, you will be saved. It is those who don't realize that they're lost that they don't get saved. Hope and pray that this will happen to many, to some people here today. That tonight you'll not be able to sleep unless you do this. You take a paper, you say my name and put the word lost or saved and then sign it. And if you think that you are lost, I hope the Holy Spirit will guide you immediately to be saved and then you can scratch lost and put saved. And you can relax. You're lost. When you're lost, you are miserable. When you're lost, you're unhappy. How could you be happy when you're lost? People try to fill that state of being lost with so many activities. Now they have the games on, right? The games, a real-time filler, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to go anywhere. You just open your, your telephone or your iPad or something. You keep playing nonsense stuff. But you know what? They're miserable. People who are lost are miserable. They are like a ship in the midst of a storm, tossed right and left. They don't know where they're going. Their life has no sense, no direction. But God doesn't want you to continue like this. And by the way, I've delivered my message to you. I've done my share. I'm not guilty. It is your responsibility. If you're still lost, I take zero blame. I can stand before the throne and say, I did my share. I told them. You don't want to receive it. It's your responsibility. But I plead with you that you take it responsibly and respond to this call, the plea. It is the voice of God who's telling you, don't continue being lost. It's dangerous because the future is lost forever. Thank God that you're still not lost forever, but don't wait. Don't delay. Don't think you can do it tomorrow. For tomorrow may never come. Tomorrow may be too late. I like that, that uh, track. Uh, I think uh, one of the sisters were distributing yesterday says tomorrow might be too late. Don't think you can, can have another chance. Today might be the last chance you will get come and be rescued from this state of being lost today right now by the only one who can save you. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, for there's no other way to be saved for there's no other name that was given under heaven by which we can be saved. It is the only name of Jesus. You come to the Savior and He will rescue you. Recognize your status that you lost and come and be rescued. And come and be found. And come and be a new person. John 5.24 says, Verily, verily, I say to you, Assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes on the one who sent, who sent me, has eternal life, will not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Three blessings. Has eternal life, will not come into condemnation, and has passed from death unto life. The moment you come and trust the Savior, your destiny will be changed from the one who was heading to hell to the one who's heading to heaven. You will be given instantaneously eternal life. And a verdict from God saying no more condemnation. No more judgment for you. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We, those who are saved, need to take that message over and over. Because guys, we are fighting against a principality. We are fighting with the ones, those, those legions of demons that are putting blinders, blinders in front of the eyes of those who are lost by Minimizing the horror of sin by minimizing their, the horror of their state and by puffing their pride and by keeping them occupied with worldly shady activities. We need to pray, but we need to take the gospel over and over. This is the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. May we do it, we are saved. And you who are still unsaved and you're not sure if you're saved or not, may you 
be honest with yourself. I want to tell you, people who are not honest with themselves will get a double judgment. If you hear that message, you don't respond to it, you're going to get a double judgment. It's going to be worse for you than the ones who didn't receive the message. But you take a moment to examine yourself and God will honor your honesty. Just be honest with yourself and ask, which word fits me best, lost or saved? And if the word lost fits you, then I hope you'll see and realize how horrible it is and you run to Jesus. He's waiting for you. He's the one who said, where two or three are gathered in my name, that should be in the midst. How much more when we are so many here gathered in his name. He's here in our midst. He's the one who counted the hair on your head. He's the one who created you. He's the one who saves. He's the one present here. And he wants to rescue you from being lost. Don't delay anymore. Run and get saved. Let's bow our heads before the Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit has brought someone to realize their status. And I hope and pray that if he hasn't yet, that you will not be able to sleep unless you come to this conclusion. Am I lost or am I saved? And I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes, remove the blinders, show you the horror of your sin show you the horrible state you are in and show you that you are still in your pride and that you need to come down and you need to let go of whatever sin, whatever pleasures, whatever shady activity you're in, no matter how wonderful it is, how great it is, pluck it out and come and be rescued. Take that one moment of seriousness. God will honor it. If you ignore that call, you will have no one to blame but yourself. I pray that this will not happen to anyone listening to this message today or any other day. Father, we thank you that you're bringing us to this truth that even that we are doing our share, and I pray that all of us will be doing each his or her share, bringing the gospel as many times as we can, to as many people as we can, with the plainest words, but even when we do this, this gospel will be hidden to many. You told us how. You told us that our fight, our warfare, is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of this evil world, in the darkness, against Satan and his, his, his agents. And we need to be not only bringing the gospel, we need to be bringing it on our knees, praying for all the people we deliver the gospel to, that we may have receptivity for this. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your salvation that is offered freely. Help us to be ambassadors and I pray for anyone here who is still unsaved, not sure that today, tonight, now will be the day of salvation for someone, for some people here today. In Christ's name, amen. May the Lord help us.